Doreen Grand Pichet is the doctor. Doreen is an expert in autism. Doreen Grand Pichet. Doctor Grand Pichet. Doctor Doreen Grand Pichet. Doctor Doreen Grand Pichet is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Doctor Doreen. Dr. Doreen. We're here with Dr. Doreen Grampiche. For those of you who don't know her, she's a true expert in the field of autism. I believe the preeminent expert in the field of autism in our time or any time. She's been working in this field for how many decades? Uh, four decades. Four decades. Four decades. And working with uh, the entire spectrum, we're talking about very small children, infants, all the way up through senior citizens. Uh, one of the things, one of the many things that I love about Dr. Grant Pichet is that she looks at individuals that are on the autism spectrum as individuals on the autism spectrum. She sees them as entire whole people that uh, have many needs and, and looks to address those needs. But she also looks at the whole unit around that person, the family, the community, and tries to help all of us. And that is life changing. I know that for a fact. Um, because my family was changed by the services that she helped to provide through the Center for Autism and Related Thank Disorders. You. I'm Thank eternally you. grateful. And, um, and we enjoyed every step. <laughs> <laughs> That's so not true, but thank you for <laughs> lying about it. <laughs> In any case, um, I'm thrilled that she is here with us for <clears throat> this period of time to answer your questions. Uh, you can be writing into us on the live feature at autism-live.com or at any one of the other sites. We'll be checking in on Facebook in just a minute. Um, and we love it when you guys write in on Facebook and tell us where you are in the world because that's particularly fun. Uh, okay, I do want to get started, though, with a question that was sent to us a couple of weeks ago by a friend of the show. Um, David Phillips has uh, been on the show before, and he is a really wonderful young man. He has his own uh, website now, mm -hmm. uh, Unlocking the Keys to Autism, and he uh, asked specifically if we would get to this question. He says, so my question is, in 2013, as part of the new diagnostic criteria for autism, they got rid of Asperger's syndrome in the DSM-5. But Dr. Doreen had said that if you were already formally diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, that you should be grandfathered in until you had to qualify for insurance funding again, um, but if it was a first-time diagnosis, the prof professionals that diagnose autism were supposed to follow the new DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for autism, which would mean there would be no Asperger's syndrome, but an individual that I know, her brother was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome in 2016 mm -hmm. as an adult, and told this individual, and I told this. And, oh, excuse me, thank you. And I told this individual that I did not think that this diagnosis was valid because of the new DSM-5 diagnostic criteria uh, for autism taking out Asperger's syndrome. Now, I told her the one way that I thought it could be valid is if they diagnosed him with autism spectrum disorder, ASD, and then listed Asperger's syndrome as an Asperger's type as part of a modifier or specifier, that is the only way I told her that I thought it could be listed, but that cannot be the actual diagnosis. So, I would <laughs> like some clarification from Dr. Grampiche on this issue, um, yada, yada, yada. <clears throat> and okay, I, I just want to clarify for people that he is referring to right before the diagnostic criteria came out, we filmed an episode with you where you talked about, but this was in 2013, and you right. talked about here is what will happen, this is how it will happen. That's um, right. That's right. So that's what he's referring yeah, to. Yeah, sounds good. Hi, DJ. Nice to hear from you again. So let me address your question here. Um, yes. So uh, you are right, what you said in terms of uh, the, di the DSM-5 does not have a diagnosis called Asperger's. It has a diagnosis of ASD, Asperger's type. So anyone who is diagnosing after the DSM-5 came out, essentially, usually when a new DSM comes out, we give about six months, maybe eight months of time for clinicians to learn the new DSM. And so basically after the DSM-5 came out, uh, which was back in 2013, yeah. 
Uh, by 2014 or so, anybody should be diagnosing correctly, which basically means they should be diagnosing with ASD, Asperger's type, for this individual. Now, I just want to uh, uh, tell you that we shouldn't get hung up on the word valid, because there's a lot of people who are still to this day, believe it or not, I still see diagnoses of Asperger's. And I'm like, okay, they didn't know they can't do that. I still see a lot of incorrect use of DSM-5. It just happens because clinicians haven't taught themselves everything and they haven't read all the details. And possibly the person who did this diagnosis is not specializing in ASD, but is perhaps a pediatrician or is like a broader practice. So they don't really know exactly the wording to use. Right now, I still get a lot of people who diagnose with an ASD and they will write something like ASD level one. That doesn't mean anything at all. Like you are not supposed to use levels. Um, you're supposed to say requires support, requires substantial support, et cetera, et cetera. And also, even if you say level one, which essentially means this individual doesn't need a lot of support, you're gonna have to say which domain, you know? Uh, level one in what? In social communication or in repetitive behaviors? So a lot of people still use the terminology incorrectly. That doesn't necessarily mean that the individual who received that diagnosis didn't, didn't have a valid diagnosis. It's not valid for the purposes of, I mean, an insurance company could come back and say, ah, this diagnosis doesn't work. Like, it's, doesn't, it's not valid. We're not going to fund it. Go get the right wording. But it doesn't mean that the individual does not have the symptoms of Asperger's. So I think we don't want to get too uh, into the, the terminology here. But, you know, a lot of I wouldn't I wouldn't assume that the person isn't actually suffering from the same symptoms. I would just say that perhaps the person who diagnosed them was hadn't kept up with the DSM terminology. There you go. So hopefully that helps to clarify. Um, and we had made the comment last week that it's never a good idea to argue with somebody about what they say their diagnosis is unless you're yeah. a qualified person. Just, yeah, you know, just, yeah. etiquette. Yeah. You know, and, and maybe you were doing it from kindness, but, you know, let them go and experience their own thing. And either that diagnosis will be accepted by their insurance or their payer or it won't, in which case they'll have to go get it reworded correctly. There you go. All right, we're going to take a short break, and then we're going to be back, please, and we're going to be checking in on Facebook when we come back, so please stick with us. Welcome back. We are here with Dr. Doreen grant Boucher, and I'm looking at the Facebook, but I, and I know that there are comments there, but I can't see them, and I don't know why, and I'm going to figure that out. Um, but we do have other comments that have come in to us and other questions. So I want to start uh, with this one because it's a particularly fabulous one. Hi, thank you for such an informative show. I'm a BCBA, and for those of you who that's a new term, that's a Board Certified Behavior Analyst. Uh, I'm a BCBA and working with a 13-year-old girl. She does not make any decisions on her own and will ask her peers to make a decision for her, even for simple things such as what color marker to use. If her therapist does not make a decision for her, she leaves the room to ask someone else. How do we teach her to make her own decisions? That's awesome. It is, it is awesome. Yeah, and uh, I, I have a couple of quick suggestions. So one is don't let her leave the room until she makes a decision. And uh, that's number one. Like literally she needs to make a decision before she's going to leave. Second thing is... You could actually even make the decision at the door. In other words, uh, you have to pick a card. And if you pick, you know, you can't see what's written on the card, but if one card says stay and the other card says leave, and it's, she has to pick it from the back, but she has to pick one. Okay. And if she picks one that says leave, she can leave. And or you can even show it to her. And if she really wants to leave the room, then she has to pick the card that says leave. <laughs> And the other thing is have her make positive negative choices. So don't start with two things that are neutral. Um, if she's hungry, she, let her choose a food that she likes. <clears throat> and the alternative choice is one that she hates. Um, if she needs to go to the bathroom, have her choose the, uh, I don't know, card that says I need to go to the bathroom as opposed to the one that says you have to stay. 
Like give her choices where there's a definite, uh, clear choice for her. Start there. Um, if you know her preferences, like food preferences, anything preferences, time preferences, clothing preferences, uh, jewelry, make whatever is her pre I don't know anything about she's 13, so you're going to have a lot of preferences. And have her choose and uh, give her the option of choosing something she really likes versus something she really dislikes. And then gradually introduce things that are also neutral. When we do choice, the first thing we do is always a dichotomy that's pretty clear. So it's like you definitely, the child is definitely motivated to choose the right thing. Yeah. And that'll help with just choices. And then you gradually have to just put her in a position where even if the two stimuli are neutral, uh, she still has to make a choice before she can go to the next activity. And really, that's as simple as it gets. I, well, it makes me think of there's a video in Skills, when and and Skills is a tool that you can use um, that does many different things, but it has lessons, mm -hmm. and a lot of lessons have a video that you can click on that shows a therapist doing the lesson right. with a child. Right. And there is a video of Logan Shepard um, that is is doing uh, choices, and the therapist is sitting there, and she has a bottle of Italian salad dressing yeah, and a lollipop. Right, that's for that is for the uh, the reading facial expression. Lesson. Oh, I thought it was for choices. Yeah, no, no, it's for reading facial expression. So basically, what she does is uh, she has a lollipop and salad dressing. Right. And this is the period of time when Logan didn't really like sal he hated salad dressing. Right. And so it was, she would say, which one do I want? That was ah, the stimulus. Okay. Which, well, that's the SD. What do I want? And he, of course, being at that point, I think two to three, right. says the lollipop, right? right? And gives her the lollipop. Right. And she takes the lollipop and, and licks it and then ah. goes, like a facial expression, oh, like, I, I hate this. That part. Yeah. And then puts it down and says, I'm hungry. Which one do I want? And the lesson is that Logan learns right away from her facial expression that that wasn't the one. Even if I like that one, it's the theory of mind lesson, right. she doesn't. Ah. So I need to now try the other thing. Gives her the salad dressing because in the beginning she does the lollipop and goes, does the salad dressing and goes, mmm. <laughs> so then now he's reading and then finally gives her the salad dressing. She sips it and says, yeah, or something like okay, that. Okay, I totally had it remembered but wrong. No, but no, so I mean, it's a, totally not, <laughs> that doesn't apply to this. But, but it gives us the opportunity to say that there are videos that demonstrate Absolutely, these and it would, it, you could use the same stimuli and you could put in front of him the lollipop because we knew at that time his preference was lollipop. Right. Put the lollipop and the salad dressing and say, pick one. And that's just making the choice, right? The, yes. In this case, the BCBA just wants to make sure this girl makes a choice. Okay. I, I have a question. Yes. Because <laughs> every once in a while I get to ask a question. Uh, there's an article that we're going to cover and in the news in a little while. You know, every once in a while this sort of pops up and it has popped its ugly head again because we're just about to head into April. Um, and the title of the article is, Can Some Children Outgrow Autism? Mm. Now this, uh, and then when you read the article, about three paragraphs down, it refers to the fact that there are studies that show that children who get intensive therapy um, can get to the point where they no longer qualify for the diagnosis. Right. But what gets me furious mm. is that the title is, Can They Outgrow Autism? Because I think even though technically, you know, a child gets to the point where they grow skills and no longer have the, you know, mm -hmm. the diagnosis apply. So you could, you could squint at it and go outgrow. The connotation of outgrow is that it just happened. Right. Organically. Right. That the, you know, the Time. autism fairy came in and bonked you on the head and you no longer have autism. Right. Which it, to me is an insult of all the work it's that offensive. you do right. and that right. we as parents do and that our kids do. And also in the article it says, is it possible that some kids are misdiagnosed? Mm -hmm. That also ticks me off. Mm -hmm. That because my child does well, some people tell me, yeah, I don't think he really had autism. Yeah. And that completely negates all the hard work that was done by right, people. Right. And I'm just wondering what your words matter. Yeah, yeah. What? So the outgrow thing really tears my yeah. ticket. How do you feel about it? Yeah, I think the the it becomes a little bit clear that the author may have had an intention by putting all of that in one article, right? Because when you put the words like outgrow and misdiagnosis in the same article, it gives the impl implied 
uh, intention that, oh, you know, there's autism, there's just a lot of kids who are misdiagnosed, and even if they're behaving slightly differently, they'll outgrow it. Okay, so that's, that is all not true. So what, the thing that, the way I look at it in regards to outgrow, uh, first of all, misdiagnosis, yeah, every, there's misdiagnosis in everything. That, yes, that means nothing. Yeah. You know, so you're not, we're not talking about the percentage of kids who are misdiagnosed. There's probably less than 1% of kids that are misdiagnosed now, same in 19, 1994. Like, I mean, you know, so misdiagnosis, nothing, means right. nothing. Um, there's, <clears throat> the, the, if the misdiagnosis is held stable between now and let's say 1994 when we had another DSM, uh, then that the only thing that we can conclude is that from that time it's gone from about one in I don't know how many uh, several hundred children to one in fifty now, mm -hmm. right? So it's it's been increasing. So let's put the misdiagnosis thing across, uh, on the uh, on the side. The whole concept of outgrowing does imply that nothing else happens during the course of time, right. but the passage of time. And so uh, with the passage of time, if, if it was, I could only answer that question really if we had the capability of putting someone in a closet for 15 years mm -hmm. and nothing else happened in their environment, okay? Because autistic children, like anyone else, learn from mm -hmm. their environment. Mm -hmm. The real question is, do they learn enough to catch up? Yeah. It's really that simple. So a child with autism or any other kind of disability is going to have certain strengths. They're going to have a couple of things where they're not at their age level. They're just below their age level. Now, some kids are significantly below various areas. Um, other kids are significant are not significantly below. They're slightly below. So, for example, an individual with aut with Asperger's type is not going to have as many deficits as a child who has very clear autism, right? Even within the ASD spectrum, a child who is 1-1, uh, uh, one, one, so in other words, basically has very minimal support needs, is definitely going to have fewer deficits than a child who has significant support needs. A nonverbal child is going to need to learn more than a verbal child. A, a child who has attention difficulty uh, is going to have to learn more than a child who doesn't have that. So there's all these levels, right? Now, so the time factor has to do with what they are exposed to and what they learn in that time. So now if someone is just living a normal life and they go to school and if they, let's say, have Asperger's type and they have an incredible teacher at school, and one of those brilliant people mm -hmm. who is focused on this child and no matter what helps this child, they could recover from that. It's, there's a possibility of that. But if it's a child who's nonverbal, has tantrums, is aggressive, has no social behavior, no eye contact, I don't care if the teacher is Albert Einstein, that teacher also has 20 other kids to deal with, that child on their own with just the passage of time and a good school program, most likely it's not gonna be enough. Right. So it's about what's enough what you do with the passage of time. Mm -hmm. And ABA is about what you do with the passage of time. ABA is a massive amount of work. It is all the work that you put in during that passage of time that makes it possible for your child to outgrow or recover. But you don't just outgrow with doing nothing about it unless you are lucky enough to have a very minimal amount of ASD affecting you and you are coincidentally exposed to a brilliant teacher or some amazing program that, that you encounter without doing anything about it. And, and I answer have, your question? It does it's answer like, my question and thank you. I wanted them to hear it from your professional mouth because I'm about, you know, later in the next hour I'm going to spout off. But I also want to say that when, when my son was diagnosed, I, like a lot of people, I went on the hunt. I was like, I need to find answers. Of course. And I was looking underneath every single rock to say, you know, what's happening. And I was talking to a parent last night and I said, you know, I made it my business to find out every single kid that was a teenager or older that was doing well and to find them and find their parents. Yeah. And if they were speaking somewhere, my tuchus was there. 
uh, in any way that I could get it there and to say, what did you do? Right. And I have yet, and now I've been covering autism, you know, from some sort of a journalistic show perspective for 10 years now. And I have, in all the people that I have interviewed, I have yet to find a person who has a life where they have no disability who can say, oh, it just happened organically. Right. It just, you know, there is, they've done a significant amount of therapy mm -hmm. and sometimes both biomedical, but I have yet to find a single person who was like, I don't know, I just outgrew it. I just yeah, figured yeah, it out yeah. on my own. Right. There is always a parent and a team behind it that worked like dogs and used ABA or I, you know, I mean, Temple Grandin still needs um, some accommodations. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Temple is very high functioning. But if you look at what her mother did, and we've interviewed her mother, but her mother and her aunt were like Honor, really yeah. proficient yeah. ABA therapists before right. they knew what ABA was. Right. Exactly some of the things that are being done with kids now, her mother and her aunt sat and did. Right. Um, so anyway. And, you know, so in general, just to kind of address the other side of the, this, most of the time, if, if you don't do things, not only will the individual not outgrow, but they get worse. Right. They don't get worse. The expectations and the, the expectations of life become more, and therefore things get worse. So in other words, as you become an adult or an older child, there are more expectations of you. And what normally typically happens is you, the individual who has been diagnosed, become frustrated and then challenging behaviors start to happen. And the, with the more time that goes by, those challenging behaviors actually become more imprinted. So it's sort of like if I spend one year, if I'm a, if I'm a two year old and I'm tantruming every time I want something instead of using my words, um, it's easy, it's not that hard for a behavior analyst to modify that behavior because it's easier to teach a two to three year old, listen, your tantrum's not going to work, you need to use your words and then it'll work and we'll reward you. But if you're like, let's say, been doing that for 15 years, it takes a lot of effort and you're a lot harder to deal with every time you tantrum. So, you know, behavior change is easier to make when you're younger, when you're when a behavior hasn't become so imprinted. And, and so, you know, not doing things just usually ends up not being the best. It ends up being worse. Okay. Um, I, I want to say uh, we have Ireland in the house, and, and we want to say happy St. Patty's Day to everybody. Um, Bonnie wants to know how to nighttime potty train a five-year-old that is already daytime potty trained. Mm -hmm. The problem that could happen with my son is that once he wakes up in the middle of the night, he will have a hard time falling back to sleep. My son talks but does not have conversational speech. So when he wakes up, he has a hard time going back to sleep. And she feels like that might be the problem. Like, I, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know whether it's that he doesn't want to wake up because then when he wakes up to go to the potty, he has a hard time going back to sleep. I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I don't know. And there's two... Uh, potty training is important to do in consecutive steps and correctly. So I will give you a couple of things to think about, but I don't want to give you extreme guidelines because I don't want to say something that might ruin your progress that you've made already. But go back and read the Fox and Azrin full protocol because it does go into nighttime training as well. The thing about nighttime training is that you have to uh, do a few different things. One is you have to stop giving liquids at around, let's assume your child is going to sleep around, how old is this child? Uh, five. Five. So let's assume your child is going to sleep around 9 p.m. or so. You should really stop giving liquids at around six. Like no more liquids um, at all and uh, make sure that you are uh, allowing the child to use the toilet before they sleep. M what, she might, what you might be referring to in regards to waking up and not being able to go back to sleep again is that we always say when a parent, when, if the child goes to bed at nine, you go to bed at let's say 10 or 11, go take your child to the bathroom one more time. Mm -hmm. And that's what you might be referring to. So if that's the case, don't do it. I mean, first of all, don't assume that your child won't go back to sleep. If you've actually done it, woken up your child, placed them on the toilet, let them go, and then you realize that, oh, every time I do this, my child wakes up and won't go back to sleep, then I understand. Yeah. But don't just make the conclusion, right? Test yeah. it out. So now if, you're, if we know for a fact that your child, if, if you 
are able to wake up your child at, let's say, 11 before you sleep, do it if they go back to sleep. If they're not going to, then what I recommend is to have the child uh, no drinking for about three to four hours prior to them sleeping. And then when they go to sleep, just let it be, but keep the night short. So start with like waking up early, so five o'clock or something, and see how short, the best way to do this, and it's hard, I know, for parents because it's so tough to figure out the length of time, but these days you guys at least have cameras. Like, uh, There's also a, a thing you can order which actually buzzes if the child wets. It's mm -hmm. just something you put under their sheet. It's mm -hmm. like a looks like a heating pad, mm -hmm. put under the sheet as soon as it uh, receives any kind of humidity or wet, it will buzz and wake the child up, mm -hmm. right? And it's a training, it's supposed to train the child to not urinate at all during the night. But if there's a way for you to figure out the, your child's baseline, in other words, how long can the child go without wetting? So in other words, if you stop drinking at like five or six and the child's in bed at nine, can he actually stay dry until about five in the morning? Mm -hmm. That's your goal. If you can do that, then your child waking up at five, then we go on and teach the child to do some other activity to engage themselves so they're not coming to wake you up. But the bottom line is we have to establish a baseline, even if it's just 9 p.m. till like three, whatever it is, then we start growing that baseline and actually then helping the child stay dry longer and longer, right? right. And it's very possible, it's just, it's just, it's a habit for children to let go, right? They yeah. have to keep it for a longer period of time. The other thing that helps, by the way, is, I don't know what his, your child's daytime schedule is. If your child is on an hourly schedule, it's too soon to do the nighttime. Okay. Your daytime schedule needs to have reached a point where your child is able to stay dry for a few hours, like okay. let's say three, and is able to actually go to the bathroom by themselves or tell you. If he's on a schedule where you need to take the child, he's not ready for sure. nighttime. Okay. All right, a couple of things I just want to go back and address. So you said Fox and Azrin, because I know that's spelled a little bit different. And uh, that, for people who don't know, that's sort of the... It's a potty training it's, Bible for us, yeah. yeah. Uh, and there are lots of books about it. You can yeah. find it online, but you, it's spelled kind of weird, right? It's like... No, it's F-O-X and A-Z-R-I-N. Okay. Yeah. Uh, also, there's a, there's a section on potty training, I believe, in IBT's website, too. Absolutely. Institute for Behavior Training. I'd really recommend you go there. There, That's an awesome training. iBehavioralTraining.com. And then, you know, for the waking up in the in the middle of the night, I know a lot of parents... Have, have gotten those toilet lights where it lights oh. up the bowl so you don't have to turn the light on in the bathroom. The only thing that's lit up is where they're going to sit. And those are and, awesome. And you get a good color that they really like and it's sort of space cool. Um, and it helps to not wake them up because the Absolutely. light is what wakes them up and then they Absolutely. can't go back to sleep. Right. It's better for you too. Definitely. You're going to hit the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing that's lit up because it's the thing that it should be, but it's very uh, eye-friendly, and then you can all go back to sleep right. afterwards. Uh, okay, do we have time for one more question? Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, good morning. My eight-and-a-half-year-old son with autism is very bright, considered high-functioning. He still has behaviors and tantrums, is fully potty, tra potty trained, and can ask for all he needs. Mm -hmm. Can ask questions like who, why, where, can have short conversations, but the things he likes... Uh, about the things he likes. About the things he likes, excuse me, like speakers, movie credits, hip-hop music. My question is, can my son still have a chance to recover with intense ABA? Uh, I have con contacted lost card. My I contacted I contacted card. card in Edison, New Jersey, and I'm waiting for a response to hopefully start services soon. He's a very smart boy, but I, like I said earlier, some sometimes has tantrums and uh, injurious behavior when frustrated or mad he'll be nine in June and she says I get sad thinking even though he's got so much potential and skills that he would not be able to recover he's also hyper and attention can be a problem please let me know your opinion and thanks in advance I would be so lost without this show we're sending oh, that's you so a nice hug of you. yeah so what I I can't I this is it's one of those things which I wish I knew more about your son if I if I could do an evaluation or something and then I could help you see the future a little bit more but I don't and this is not enough information for me to be able to say whether how far he'll go right 
But my recommendation to you is, I mean, it sounds like he's learned quite a lot. And that's great. That It sounds like he's doing well. And I do recommend that you get him into an ABA program as soon as you possibly can and that you do a lot of work, right? If you can, and this is one of the problems we hit when our kids are eight or nine or whatever, they're in school. And so our hours become extremely limited and also funding sources generally won't fund comprehensive programs for kids over the age of eight. So, um, you know, at best your child will probably get something like 10, 15, maybe 20 hours of one-to-one -one therapy, which is gonna be extremely helpful. What I recommend for you to do is a couple of things. One is don't set a recovery as your goal. Every single year, try to set a goal which has to do with the things you want your son to learn that year. So uh, here's what you can do today, okay? You don't, you don't have to wait for us. You can get on, you can do two things, which is what I did specifically for parents. Get on skills, and the website for that is skillsforautism.com, skillsforautism.com. Get on skills. And when you're on skills, do everything. Get on there, answer the, get on, become a client, answer the assessment questions about your son. Um, it'll help you identify exactly what he needs to learn. From there, you will look and determine exactly what you want to accomplish every year, right? This year, I would like him to, you know, have longer conversations. I want his conversations to be directed at children. I want him to be able to read facial expression. I'll be, you'll be, you, you'll be shocked at the amount of choice you have at, on skills. Like, it's, we're not talking, you know, we're talking about, you can choose things like, oh, I want him to tell jokes. I want him to be able to lie. I want him to, it's everything and anything you want is on there. So, but you have to spend some time. Like, and I suggest you, you set goals for yourself where you say, I'm going to do an hour on skills every day. It'll take a week to answer the assessment, great. Then it'll take you, give yourself time, give yourself a month to acclimate. It's, and Shannon has helped a lot of people acclimate to skills. It's a big platform, it is big. It's like going into a supermarket for the mm -hmm. first day and like, what are all these things? So give yourself time because if you really learn skills, you will benefit from it beyond your imagination. Now, and, and you're not going to do all of it. You're just going to help se select the things, right? And then you're going to go on IBT, which is iBehavioralTraining.com, the Institute for Behavior Training. And there you will teach yourself the techniques. You will learn how to teach things. You will learn how to get rid of challenging behaviors. You will learn how to, uh, you know, what you do whenever he has a tantrum. You'll learn what to do to get his attention. You'll learn what to do to not allow him to injure anyone or himself. You'll, you'll understand autism and you'll understand what these behaviors are about and you'll understand how to teach. So it's simple for him to understand. So do all of that because this will keep you very engaged and I promise you every day you'll learn something new, every single day. Then you can work on teaching him and hopefully by then, a team of ABA experts have also joined you, and together you will now give him a lot of attention and support, and you'll make up for what even people who start at three years old, maybe they're not doing the right thing. Don't worry about time, don't worry about recovery. Worry about what you can do now, yourself, train yourself, and get a team of people to assist and support, and you work on it together. You know, don't assume that as soon as you get into a card program, you're gonna have a whole bunch of people come and just take care of recovery. That's not how it works. It is all about your involvement. And I'm sorry, because I know as a parent, we're already overwhelmed, but you'll enjoy it. It's like kind of going to the gym. You don't wanna do it at first, but once you get into it, you're like, I feel great. You will feel a lot better. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that I talk to parents about all the time is that CARD did a study a few years ago um, to see what predicts the best outcomes. Right. And um, I, I get really excited about talking that because um, it, it wasn't... Uh, 
you know, minimize down to age, but the best outcomes come when there are three things that you do consistently. And one of them was give your child as many opportunities to learn as possible. Right. 24 seven. Right. You know, Absolutely. as many opportunities as you can. The second one was having uh, an experienced BCBA in your case, which if you get in with Edison, New Jersey, that's going to help you to be able to do that because all card offices have experienced BCBAs. But the third one, and, and I said earlier when I shopped around and I was like, what, what is consistent with all these kids that are doing well was parent involvement. If the parents learned it and followed through on it, it helped with the first one, which is having the many opportunities. <laughs> and every parent that I saw who said, you know, we're going to do as much as we can. And the thing that I said was, I want to be able to look him in the eye when, I, when he's 18 and be able to say we did everything we could. Wherever that gets us, I, I'm going to love him like there's nobody's That's business fair. and accept him wherever he is. But I want to be able to look at him and tell him we did it all. And if you do that, I can tell you, you will be thrilled with where you end up. I, don't, I haven't met a single parent who at the end didn't say, you know what, we are, we are fabulous. We're good. So that's, uh, I think, hand in hand with what, what Dr. Grand Pichet said. If you do those three things every day, you're going to be okay and your kiddo's going to be okay. And there's going to be tremendous growth. Definitely. All right. Definitely. We need to let you go. Yeah, but before I go, I just want to thank you and I want to do a <laughs> shout out to Charlie. Charlie, Shannon bought these for you. No, no, no. Th these oh, were these gifts. Were donated. Okay. These were gifts, I have to say, from Imperial <laughs> Toys, who we love. They're awesome. But can I show you something yes, fun that please. we learned you can do with these chickens because we've been playing with them. And uh, Charlie was here, uh, our fabulous Beyond intern. Intern doesn't cover it when we were doing the toys. So I had to send these to Charlie. But we discovered that when you lock their legs... <laughs> This is what happens when, oh you, my when, God. when you work at Autism Live. You discover <laughs> that they balance each other. So please take the chickens home to Charlie because uh, we miss Charlie. But Imperial Toys sent these over to us because they love knew it. I love we would it. be very happy with them. So, Charlie, <laughs> yes. they have to go home and live with you. You can name them and let us know. Uh, <laughs> All right, we are going to take a break, and then we got a little bit of time before it's time for Let's Talk Autism uh, with Shannon and Nancy. But don't forget that we're going to have Karen Nolte on that hour, and we're also going to have Dr. Carrie Magro. But uh, stay tuned. First, look at this. <laughs> 